It is so good to be here today. Welcome once again to Pentecost 2023. We're assembled on this holy day because we're commanded to, but it is filled with such wonderful meaning for all of us who are called in this time, in this age. This day commemorates the day which inaugurated the New Testament Church of God, the New Testament Church, a brand new dispensation. And it would be revolutionary in the spiritual development of people all around the world. Mr. Ian Neal mentioned it was an anniversary observance, which it is. Today's a memorial of the day when the door was opened to all nations on earth, being given a privilege to become grafted into the spiritual Israel of God, as many as God would call. In the Roman Empire, in the Apostles' Day, it was the known world at that time of their day. It was a time when there was a network of well-protected mail routes uh, through Asia Minor and where mail could be safely delivered by boat or a horseback uh, or a cart through the empire. And that was a very important development in ancient times. And there was also a widespread common language, Greek, which could give communication across a wide swath of landmass at the time. Again, the known world at the time. And so those two factors, the mail routes and the common language alone allowed for the gospel to be preached far and wide. In our lifetime, in this generation, we've been watching doors opening for the last 70 or more years, 75 years, to preach the gospel to a world on a much larger scale with the assistance of modern technology, radio, TV, of course, the print, print presses, not to just millions, but now to billions. A few months ago, the uh, estimate of the world population reached the eight billion mark and growing. We live in a dizzying world of electronic media, don't we? I mean, it's just everywhere. I won't go into too many statistics because they're dizzying by themselves, but just, a, just about three of them, that's all. It's not slowing down anytime soon. I gathered these just recently, a couple days ago. The internet use, firstsiteguide.com says globally 5.5 million, a billion people use the internet daily. 5.5 billion out of those 8 billion. Cell phone use, zipia.com says there are almost 7 billion cell phone users throughout the world. Facebook us usership, social network, uh, working is, is increasing all the time. Statista.com says there are 2.9 billion monthly Facebook users globally. These are platforms that instantaneously can transmit video, voice, and text. Uh, I mentioned a few weeks ago about artificial intelligence and the, uh, the, the explosion onto the scene and how it might in, impact all of our lives very soon. AI computer programs generally called chatbots are being developed that can now translate text into about a thousand different languages. Well, that's becoming old news now. That's becoming old. Now, the technology is being developed that will translate speech into a foreign language in real time. Now, maybe there's a, a second or two delay, but uh, the AI technology has access to an enormous digital library of common words, meanings, and other data that it has, it has gathered through past analyses of millions upon millions of documents from the internet into many different languages. So there have been devices that have been designed and used by the US military and others to go into the Middle East, let's say, and speak Arabic. You speak into a, a device and it has a speaker, and then out comes the same sentence in Arabic, and that, that may be just a, you know, that's pretty awesome too, but there's something coming that's faster than that even. 
Can you imagine speaking into a device and the speaker on the other side is, is maybe only delayed milliseconds and it is, is conversing and conversant in whatever language, thousand different languages? You see what potential there is for preaching the gospel in some, some of these technologies? So with all those tools in this generation, it's a sort of revolution in information sharing and language barriers that humanity has faced, faced all its history are, are, are soon going to be diminished. The world of sharing information has become faster and more accessible than ever before in human history. And the gospel message will be utilizing those technologies. I won't turn, but Ephesians 3, verse 1, a reference. Ephesians 3, verse 1. This begins the third chapter of Paul's prison epistle. It was written around 61 AD, about three decades after Christ's resurrection. Ephesians 3, verses 1 through 4, Paul says, For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus for you Gentiles, if, ne in, if indeed you, heard of, you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which was given to me for you, how that by revelation he made known to me the mystery, and he's talking about a revealed mystery, verses 5 and 6, which in other ages was not made known to the son of, sons of men, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel. That was a revolution in Paul's day, that this day represents a time when the gospel message would start to go out among the Gentile nations, no longer just uh, hovering around uh, the Jewish or the Israelitish nation. And uh, it was meant to go out far earlier, but the Jews boxed themselves in. By the time Jesus Christ arrived on the earth, they had closed off the rest of the world and disdained others and as Gentiles as unclean and, 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 and just not worthy of hearing the good news that God had in the Bible, in the Old Testament. This was all going to change. This was going to change with the inauguration of the New Testament. Today is a day that reminds us of special dispensations, gifts, as we spoke about yesterday, and miracles God gave to his church and of Christ to take this message to all peoples and to strengthen and edify the believers. Today is a day that reminds us that the Church of Jesus Christ is continuing to mature, continuing to move forward in the midst of increasing turbulence and trouble in the world, as we also heard about, and how these spiritual gifts have been provided to build up God's people in the midst of terrible news that we hear. This day, we're also reminded that we don't live in the only day of salvation. This is not the only period or age of salvation, but that what God is currently doing with you and me is reaping an early harvest of first fruits and preparing the way for a much greater harvest later. So the gospel message of the coming kingdom of God had a very small beginning in Jerusalem in 31 AD. And reaching into the expanse of the Holy Roman Empire, the Roman Empire, <laughs> the unholy Roman Empire, reaching into that expanse was profound. But the commission of God's church is to preach into every nation before Christ returns. And that job is still ongoing. My title today is simply The Smallest Seed. The Smallest Seed seed. Please join me in Acts 1, verse 1. Acts 1, verse 1 in your Bible. While you're turning, the book of Acts was written by, quote, the beloved physician, Luke. The beloved physician. Luke was a Gentile convert. His book was written to a certain dignitary, probably a local ruler or a governor named Theophilus. Little could Luke have known when he wrote 
this book, that his account would be shared all around the world by Jews and Gentiles alike for what would be for the next 2,000 years now. Little would he have known this. And while Luke's historical account covers a period little more than three decades long, from start to finish in the book of Acts, about three decades, it's filled with important lessons for God's church in every age. Let's read verses 1 through 3. It shows here that uh, Luke had already written to this governor or this uh, local ruler, Theophilus, previously. It said, The former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach until the day in which he was taken up after he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs, being seen by them during 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. We keep in mind, Luke was not present when the 12 disciples followed Jesus Christ for three and a half years. He was not one of the original 12 apostles. He gathers the stories, though, from them and writes this account from the disciples and those that are also the outer circle of disciples, and that they had received this power from God, this power from on high that he had promised. Let's read verses 4 through 8. And Jesus, being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, John the baptizer, before or set, setting the way or uh, providing the way for Jesus Christ to come into renown in his own country. He says, John baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? And he said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all of Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth, all the way reaching around the world. Let's skip to Acts 2, verse 2. Acts 2, verse 2 is just a snapshot here of one of the small beginning events in just a few weeks after Jesus Christ rose from the grave. Verses 2 through 4, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. It was a sound of a wind. We're not told if they felt wind, but it was a sound of a rushing wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. A very dramatic, a very uh, public display of a uh, manifestation gift, as we had spoken of yesterday. One of those where suddenly a miracle occurred. Let's skip to verses 14 through 18. Chapter 2, verses 14 through 18. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, this would be when they went outside and people started rushing from uh, the neighborhoods that heard this sound and came to see what this was all about. Apparently they heard the same rushing wind and they came to see what this was. Peter has them stop and he raises his voice and says to them, men of Judea and all those who dwell in Jerusalem, let's keep in mind that when these holy days came, Passover was probably the largest time of pilgrimage when people came from all around the surrounding lands who were converts, proselytes, who Jews that would come in to Jerusalem and swell it by about two million more people. Uh, this is what scholars believe than normally lived there. Pentecost is another holy day season when people would come from all around many different countries with their own foreign languages and cultures. And they'd all come and merge those that were there that morning of Pentecost who were within uh, sound of this, this noise, this wind. And so 
It says, for these are not drunk. I'm skipping ahead of some of the dialogue here. Let it be known to you and heed my words. They're not drunk because they're speaking foreign languages, as you suppose. It's only the third hour of the day. But this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. And he quotes Joel 2, verse 28 here, which was a part of Joel's full prophecy. He quotes it, though, verses, uh, verse 17 in Acts 2. And it shall come to pass in the last days, says God, that I will pour out of my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Peter apparently had this prophecy memorized. He quoted it uh, almost verbatim here. Verse 18, and on my, mess my manservants and my maidservants, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they shall prophesy. Now, I pause at that point because there's more to Joel's prophecy that really points to the end of the age at the time of Christ's return and the beginning of the millennial age. But this much was something that Peter says, this is happening right now, as much as I read just there. It's happening right now. Now, in the book of Acts, God clearly indicates that his people would continue to experience this presence and this power of the Holy Spirit, the same Holy Spirit that was manifest that morning of Pentecost in Jerusalem, the same one, and that this power would continue to open doors and embolden God's servants to continue to take his message to the world and to continue to grow spiritually, personally. Skipping to Acts 3, verse 1. Acts 3, verse 1. It was a moment of a touching story of how Peter healed a lame man through the name of Jesus Christ. Acts 3, verses 1 and 2. Now Peter and John went up together to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. And a certain uh, man lame from his mother's womb was carried, whom they had daily laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms for those who entered the temple. So it was in a, a corridor where people were coming and going. People would bring him daily and lay him down on a mat, and he would just sit there asking for coins. The event happened just a short time, I should say, after the descent of the Holy Spirit on Pentecost. Peter and John going up to the temple to worship, they saw the gate beautiful. They saw the crippled man who had been crippled since birth, 40 years. Verses 3 through 6. This man, who seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked for coins, he asked for alms. And fixing his eyes on him with John, Peter said, look at us. So the crippled man gave his attention to them. They, he was expecting to receive something. Maybe he had his hand out or a cup. Verse 6, then Peter said, silver and gold I don't have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, stand up and walk. And we know the story. It's so exciting to see this man jumping and leaping for joy and clinging on to Peter and John with his newfound ability to walk after 40 years being lame from birth. Now the disciples... After receiving the Holy Spirit, we know they went through a transformation. They would regret deeply a lot of the things that Jesus Christ was teaching them during the three and a half years when so much went right over their heads. So much they took lightly. Uh, many times he would especially try to warn them or, or prepare them for his absence and for the crucifixion and the suffering he was going to face. They didn't comprehend it until after it was over and it had more meaning. But they went through a time of bewilderment. They also went through a time of growth, tremendous growth. These 12 men, like many other disciples, had a deep sense of their own insufficiency, that they had to learn to trust God and to lean on God for, uh, for the power they needed. And so through humble prayer, we see in the accounts and acts, they joined their weakness with the strength of God in Christ. They attached 
their lack of higher polished education to God's wisdom. They substituted their unworthiness to Christ's righteousness. And they traded their poverty for his infinite spiritual wealth. That was the only way they would be equipped for the tasks which Jesus laid before them to go into all the world preaching the gospel unto everyone, making disciples. We continue, verses 7 through 10. Let's read. And Peter took him by the right hand, lifted him up, and immediately his feet and his ankle bones received strength. So he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered the temple with them, walking, leaping, and praising God, the crippled man. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. And then they knew it was he who sat begging for alms at the gate beautiful of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had just happened to this man. Let's skip to Acts 4, verse 23. Acts 4, verse 23. That was a major public event. That was outdoors. People saw it. They followed in. Peter and John holding this man that had never walked in his life. Or him clinging to them, actually. And it was a strong testimony. Peter and John were arrested after this. They were thrown in prison by the temple chief and the Sadducees. They were quite upset with this preaching. They thought after the death of Jesus Christ, this whole movement would die out. Whew. Boy, we got rid of that man that was causing so much disturbance and robbing us of our popularity and our, our, uh, our influence on the people. Oh, no. It was just beginning. It was just beginning. Verses 23 through 26. They were let go because they feared the people. It was a holy day season. They didn't want to cause a commotion after witnessing an obvious miracle. Verses 23 through 26, being let go, they went on their own uh, to their own companions and reported what the chief priests and the elders had said to them. So when they had heard that, they raised their voices with, to God with one accord and said, Lord, you are God who made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them who by the mouth of your servant David have said, and he, they're quoting Psalm 2 and verse 1, why did the nations rage and the people plot vain things? The kings of the earth took their stand and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. They're quoting a Psalm of David. That event, though, was just one of many little seeds that would be planted in those early years, starting in Jerusalem, on the day of Pentecost. And in the book of Acts, you see numerous accounts, numerous signs and wonders, numerous healings, numerous profound guidance by God speaking through the Holy Spirit. And this book of Acts had been copied over and over and over and distributed, copied by hand for 1,400 years. Then, in the year 1455. Something major happened in technology. 1455, this book of Acts would begin to be printed on a new machine called the movable type press, where you would have little letters that could be set, and then you could print page after page after page and bind them in books and make them vastly more easily and less expensive than hand writing copies. Today there are 48 known copies of the Gutenberg Bible. The Old Testament in the Latin Vulgate, the New Testament in Greek. It was profound. Now, mostly only wealthy people could afford these, and they would buy them for themselves, or they would buy them for, for churches uh, or, or other audiences, but the average common folk, they couldn't afford these. They're still very, very, very expensive. Again, they're very rare relics today, 48 known copies of them today. They're among the most valuable books in the world. More advances would have to come before these would start to become more available and cheaper to print for the average everyday man. Today, globally, 
about 100 million Bibles on average are printed every year around the world. About 100 million Bibles per year around the world. The Zondervan Press states that there are nearly 400 versions of the Bible currently in print and being sold annually. 400 different versions. We're hoping for the day when there are 2,000 different versions and different dialects and different tongues. That could happen. That could happen with the electronic media that we have today. So the same power of the Holy Spirit that worked through the main characters in the story of the book of Acts, Paul and Peter, John, James, and others, can and will still work powerfully in God's church among his followers today, helping us to grow unto spiritual maturity up till the return of Jesus Christ. That same power. Please turn with me to Mark 4 and verse 30. Mark 4 and verse 30. Jesus Christ gave a series of parables to liken something to the kingdom of God, to help us to get a grasp, a mindset around what the kingdom of God is going to be like. And here's one. One particular parable is describing the kingdom of God as the start of a mustard seed, which a man took and planted, and it grew to be a very, very large tree. Let's read together Mark 4, verse 30. Jesus asks the question, to what shall we liken the kingdom of God? Verse 31, he answers his own question. It is like a mustard seed, which when it is sown on the ground, is smaller than all the other seeds of the earth. A little parenthetical thought, probably more true to Palestine. Literally, it's not the smallest seed in the entire world, but true to Palestine and proverbially speaking and regionally speaking. Uh, smaller than all the seeds of the earth. Verse 32, but when it is sown, it grows up and becomes greater than all the herbs and shoots out large branches so that the birds of the air may nest under its shade. So it gives a picture of some, some very large planted plant that uh, it starts as a very, very tiny seed, a little dot, if you will. So again, Jesus explains the nature of the kingdom of God being like a mustard seed, and it's like something that starts very, very small, and the kingdom of God just like those events in Jerusalem that are recounted in the book of Acts, they started small, but they will end very large. The end point of the gospel message will be a very, very large outcome. This is the way God has designed it. Just consider how Jesus Christ came into the world as, as a point of reference. He's a baby born to a family of very modest beings. His surrogate father, Joseph, was a carpenter, what we would say is a skilled blue-collar job, in a little town of Galilee. Jesus Christ grows up, and he's obedient to his parents, faithful, and he continues to probably be a light to his whole community and his neighborhood until he leaves home. He calls 12 disciples after praying one night for God's guidance, he trains them to become his followers. The disciples seem to grow ever so slowly. I mentioned earlier a lot of things that Jesus Christ told them went in one ear and out the other. They didn't grasp the meaning of them until they received the Holy Spirit. And many things. At times, it seemed to Jesus Christ they weren't growing at all. He would say, at the last, he would say, I wish I wanted to share more things with you, but you're not ready yet. And so they would learn more over the 40 days that Jesus Christ came back and saw them, preparing them for their mission. And also beyond that, as he gave them inspiration through the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit did help them to grow and become spiritually emboldened heroes of faith who changed world history these heroes of the Bible. If you read to the end of the book of Acts, you see the wonderful things that God had them do through many trials and tribulations, through many dangers, toils, and snares, and many of them were martyred at the end. 
the Jews and the disciples expected in Jesus' day for the kingdom of God to be set up on earth as it was like in the time of Solomon. They expected Jesus Christ to push out the Roman occupiers and establish his throne right where King David would be. It didn't happen because it wasn't the time. Jesus said the kingdom of God would start small, or he showed this, but it would become a place of great comfort and shelter and a great planted tree, if you will, in the future. The message of the kingdom of God has slowly been spreading across five oceans into six continents, and there is much more still to be done. I won't turn, but 1 Corinthians 3 and verses 7 through 9, Paul tells us that we cultivate environments like planting the truth and watering, nurturing God's people. But then we wait for God to miraculously grow the seed into a tree. I'll read it to you. 1 Corinthians 3, verses 7 through 9. Paul was answering a question about people's alliances to either Apollos or Paul, and it was causing division. So what does he say? He says, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. It was God who caused the seed to grow. Verse 7, so then neither he who plants is anything nor he who waters, but it is God who gives the increase. Now he who plants and he who waters are one, and each one will receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are God's fellow workers, and you are God's field, you are God's building. God is not going to be remiss to recognize the labor and the work and the service that his people do, and he will reward accordingly, and he will save up a, ma a magnificent award that doesn't fail, it doesn't fade, it doesn't get spent, it doesn't corrode, it doesn't get eaten by moths, he says, our treasure in heaven which will last for eternity. But God does the increasing. God does the increasing. I would like to turn to Romans 8 and verse 23 with you. Romans 8 and verse 23. Now in Romans 8 verse 23, here Paul shows that he well understood that those called and converted in this age are the first fruits in God's master plan of salvation. Verse 23, we also, who have the first fruits of the Holy Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. We anxiously await. We have this hope within us. And the hope springs eternal, as they say. It is something that has given us purpose, vision, and expectation of what God has in store. And yet we long for it, now that we have this hope. We long for the day that we have this, these immortal bodies of spirit that don't feel pain, tiredness, hunger, thirst, or the aging process. We long for it now. Jesus Christ said that those called to be followers in this age are not to be of this world, as I am not of this world. He says this in John 17, verse 16. So part of our calling is to separate from the ways of the world. Those who are, of us who are called out of the world are expected to develop the character of Jesus Christ, which goes against the flow of the world. The great majority of humankind, though, is not going to respond to a calling in this age. Oh yes, many are called, few are chosen. That's the pattern that God has revealed to us. And the reason goes back to the parable of the sower, which I'll just paraphrase uh, on a few points here. Matthew 13, verse 10, is the parable of the sower. And when the disciples hear the parable, they ask, why do you talk to people in parables? And then he gives them the answer. He said, I mean, he gives them the revelation of what the parable is about. Verses 18 through 23, if anyone hears the word of the kingdom, does not understand it, the wicked comes, the wicked one, Satan, comes, snatches it away, that which was sown in his heart. He is the one 
like the seed thrown on the path, the wayside, the hard ground, the pavement. It doesn't take root, doesn't get water, doesn't get nourished by the soil. It just doesn't grow. Satan takes that hope away right away. Verse 20, he who receives seed on stony places, he's the one who hears the word, but immediately receives it with joy, and then it has no root in it, but endures only for a little while. For when tribulation and persecution arises because of the word, immediately he stumbles. Satan again is at work trying to rob those who hear the gospel truth of what is said. Immediately he stumbles. Verse 22, Now he who received the word of seed among the thorns is he who hears the word. But the cares of this life and deceitfulness of riches choke off the word, distractions, focusing on career, on money-making, so, so that it crowds out time to meditate and contemplate and keep God's way of life. So many people become distracted. They are among those where the seed is thrown among thorns. But fourth, the fourth category, verse 23, he who received seed on the good ground, the fertile soil, the moist soil that was going to enrich and allow the roots to run deep, it's he who hears the word and understands it. And this seed will bear fruit, and it produces some a hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirtyfold. These are the ones that take hold of the gospel message and run with it. So God knows there are many who are called, but very few will take the time, the effort, and the hard work, and the challenge of staying with the truth. Through the Holy Spirit, which God gives to those who are part of God's church, members are given the empowerment to overcome the world and to continue to grow and bear fruit. Once again, this harvest of fruit at this age is small. It's a small beginning. It's because at this time very, very few will accept God's calling, repent and be converted, and remain faithful to God's way of life. Jesus Christ said, narrow is the way and difficult is the path which leads to life. And there are very few who find it, very few who respond to it. Let's please turn to John 14, verse 1. John 14, verse 1. Jesus Christ is still preparing his disciples for when he has to leave them. As you're turning, they're going to continue this work, this commission he gives them, without his daily involvement in their lives and his daily leadership. Jesus was about to be separated from them. They'd be like sheep in a surrounding of wolves. And he knew they would suffer persecution, that they and their followers would be cast out of the synagogues when they declared that they believed Jesus Christ and in his resurrection. They'd be thrown in prison sometimes. He knew that for witnessing of him as the Messiah, some would even suffer martyrdom. He encouraged them, though, that their coming trials, they might remember his words and be strengthened to continue to do this work that was put before them. Let's read John 14, 1 through 4. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions or many compartments, many places. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may also be. And where I go, you know, and the way you know. He had already revealed to them he's going back to his father's throne. He was going to go back. Here's another way to put it. In other words, when I go away, I shall still work earnestly for you every day and every night. I came into the world to reveal myself to you that you might believe. I now go to my father and your father to work together with him on your behalf. That's essentially what Jesus Christ was saying. And he says the same to you and me. Verses 12 through 14. 
John 14, 12 through 14, most assuredly I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. And greater works than these he will do, because I go to my Father. And whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. All within the framework of God's uh, purpose for us and his will for us. All within those things. Skipping to John 15, verse 26. John 15, verse 26. But when the Helper comes, which I shall send to you from the Father. Remember the word, it says whom here, but the word in Greek can be which. It doesn't have to be a personified. The Helper, which I shall send to you from the Father, the Spirit of Truth, the Parakletas, who proceeds from the Father, it will testify of me, and you also will bear witness, because you have been with me from the beginning. And so, after Jesus Christ left them, on that day of Pentecost, 31 AD, with the Holy Spirit now dwelling in them, many of these words would come back to memory. Many of these thoughts would come back to mind and be refreshed in their, in their minds that they heard, but they didn't understand at the start. Very exciting to see this. And so Jesus Christ also speaks about being one as the Father and the Son are one. Verse 23, may they be brought into complete unity to let the world know that you sent me and have loved me even as you loved me. You loved them even as you loved me. These are the words he spoke on the last Passover he had with those inner circle of disciples. At the Inf International Ministerial Conference, one more illustration here, Mr. Doug Horchak spoke on one of his presentations on teamwork within the ministry. But the principles apply to all of us, teamwork within the congregation. He said, Christ did not just pray for the 12, but for all those who would come later throughout the age, that we may all be one. It was about the wonderful things we as a church body can do together that will help us to be witnesses to the world. At the same time, Satan will always be targeting the unity and the togetherness of the church. Mr. Jim Franks mentions often, and he did again last week, how for 13 years we've seen peace and camaraderie and unity in God's church starting from the leadership on down. And he's, he's very pleased that God has allowed that period of time. So Mr. Horchek shared lessons and principles from a, more, uh, a former Navy SEAL, Admiral William McRaven, U.S. Navy retired. He gave a speech, a commencement address at University of Texas at Austin back in 2014. And then he wrote a book on these things as well. Well, the book became a New York Times number one bestseller, the book titled, Make Your Bed, Little Things That Can Change Your Life and Maybe Change the World. That's the whole title. Well, briefly, here are the 10 points that he mentioned, very, very briefly here. It starts off with, make your bed. And I, I remember when I was first reading that uh, several years ago, it's, it's a mindset. It's not like some magic is going to occur if I get out of bed and I make it before I go downstairs and get my cup of coffee. Sometimes I'd rather get my coffee first. Mo all, always would rather get my coffee first. Always. Then I'll come back up later and I'll make the bed. But he says, make your bed. Pay attention to detail is his point. Do little things right. Number one. Number two, paddle as a team. Navy SEALs and their training and their air-filled uh, rafts out on the water. Paddle as a team. What he means by that is don't try to change the world all by yourself. Number three, don't discount the small guys. Don't discount the small guys. We're not to judge by appearances. Look after the people that often get overlooked, that are in our circle of influence. Number five, I'm number four. You will never be perfect. But keep moving forward anyway. We'll never be perfect, but keep moving forward anyway. Number five, life is not fair. 
And you will fall at times. You will fail at times. We're to get back up with God's help and keep going. Number six, the rope slide. Sometimes you have to go for it. Take a risk. One of those training exercises. I'm trying to picture in my mind what the rope slide looked like. I don't remember, but it's something that I'm sure is daunting and uh, something where not everyone by nature wants to do without training. Take risks. Number seven, do not back down from the sharks in life. Be bold and courageous when the times are required for it. Times call for it. Don't back down from the sharks in life. Number eight, it's during the darkest moments that we will need to do our best as a team. Number nine, hope. One, one person can change the world by giving hope. Lift up the downtrodden. Number 10, never ring the bell. Any of you that have watched training of the Navy SEALs, there's one way to bail out through the most intense and arduous and difficult of the series of weeks they go through training. It's if you can't handle it, if you just feel like this is just too much, you walk up to the middle of the camp, you grab the, the, the rope and you ring the bell, and then you're, you're out of the, uh, the training. It's that simple. The bell is a seal training in the center. If you want to quit, you ring the bell and you walk away. But he says, don't do that. <laughs> in a spiritual sense, we're not to ever ring the bell. And so these are just points Mr. Doug Horchak pointed out for us as a team to focus on in a spiritual sense, in the spiritual sense. In Luke 11, verse 9, please turn there with me. Luke 11, verse 9. Luke 11, verse 9. It's a reminder for all of us Verses 9 through 13. So I say to you, ask and it shall be given to you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. And everyone who seeks finds. And to him who knocks it shall be opened. If a son asks for bread from any father among you, will he give him a stone instead of bread? Or if he asks for a fish, will his father give him a serpent instead of a fish? Verse 12, or if he asks for an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? Uh, these are the, then, if, then. Obviously, they're rhetorical questions. The answer is no, no, and no. A loving father would never do those things. And so, Jesus Christ follows. Verse 13, if you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, if you being carnal, physically minded, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? It is for the asking. It's available to you and me if we ask for it. God is more willing to give his Holy Spirit to those who serve him than parents are to give good gifts to their children. It's a profound analogy, profound comparison. The helper, the comforter, the parakletos, the advocate, the Holy Spirit is just as much ours for the asking as it was for the apostles 2,000 years ago. It's what opens our minds to spiritual truths. Jesus Christ said it will guide us into all truth, the Holy Spirit. It guides us in our personal prayer life. It empowers us to be witnesses and examples to others gives us the power daily to overcome our personal weaknesses. It gives us an inner joy that's not dependent on outside circumstances. It helps us to understand our absolute dependence on God for every breath to guide us from day to day in every day that we live. This is what the apostles had to come and realize after they received the Holy Spirit, how much they depended on God to fulfill the commission Jesus Christ gave them. We're drawing to a close. I won't turn, but I'll reference 1 Peter 2 and verse 9. 1 Peter 2 and verse 9. Since we live in this age of first fruits, the time during which God has been calling and that people in a small community are responding and growing in faith to reign with Jesus Christ, 
1 Peter 2, verse 9, but you're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who once were not a people, who once were not a unified, cohesive group, are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. And one more reference here is 2 Corinthians 4, verse 17. It says, 2 Corinthians 4, 17 and 18, for our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and external weight of glory, eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. The Christian lives by faith and not by sight. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. God is working in us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. The gospel of the kingdom of God started very small. That one day in Jerusalem when the Holy Spirit was poured out and it started just as the analogy Jesus Christ gave as the smallest seed in Palestine, the mustard seed. Well, Christ's words and his promises were fulfilled in the apostles. They spoke through the power of the Holy Spirit and under the stirring of human hearts by that power, thousands were converted in that time. Even on this first day of Pentecost, 3,000 people were baptized. They had been listening, they'd been hearing for from perhaps years about this man of God, this prophet named Jesus Christ. And so they knew some of his teachings, otherwise it would have been, this would have been awfully challenging for 3,000 people who had never heard part of this gospel message to be baptized. It would be kind of, uh, shall we say, irresponsible to baptize people that didn't know anything. <laughs> so they knew things. The fact that these disciples were humble commoners would not diminish their influence. But by their low and humble backgrounds, they would actually increase their influence because the hearers of this word transcends the fancy attire and the gold and the silver and the raiment that would have been a distraction. So they were common people. The wonderful teachings of the apostles, the encouraging words, they assured people that it was not their own power that they did this but only through the power of Jesus Christ and the Father. Picture in your mind as I close a great future spiritual harvest of people added to the family of God during the thousand-year reign of Jesus Christ and a very great harvest at the end of the great white throne judgment. Then maybe you and I can also picture how we've been invited in this period of early harvest to be pioneers, to be pathfinders for many others who will look to us, for example, who will look to us for guidance and direction and instruction. What a blessing and a responsibility that we have to be called in this age now. The book of Acts ends quite abruptly. <coughs> it ends in chapter 28. It records the journey of Paul from Malta to Italy where he finally settles in Rome. The last words of chapter 28 of the book of Acts are, verse 30, Paul stayed there two full years in his own rented house, welcoming all who came to visit him. Boldly and freely he proclaimed the kingdom of God and taught about the Lord Jesus Christ. Period. It ends. The book of Acts ends on that note. But why? Well, the abruptness with which the book of Acts closes is probably not accidental. It does suggest to us that there is a very thrilling and exciting narrative that is to continue. It's unfinished. It includes you and me. <laughs> that the acts of God through his Holy Spirit are to have a sequel throughout the Christian dispensation, throughout this age and the age to come. Each successive generation, and the one after and the one after, adding 
chapters full of wonder and beauty and power of the Holy Spirit and God's influence in our lives. And it all started as the smallest seed.